For a century, great collections of world art and archaeological discoveries have been hidden behind these walls. Now, everything has changed. We have created, in effect, a new museum that is for the widest possible audiences that reveals the treasures that Cambridge field workers, researchers, collectors, travellers have put together of the archaeology and anthropology of the world. We have a new entrance and this museum is genuinely open to the widest public. We also have a completely new ground floor. A whole range of conservation work has been done, curatorial work has been done to produce a completely new set of displays. For the first time we have a case that introduces the museum, that gives a sense of the kind of research that's undertaken here and the stories that the collections reveal. They're stories that are engaging to the widest possible audiences. This new display, this case, has seen us bring a whole range of people in and engage wider publics than we had before. The museum represents great discoveries that were made in the past, but is also engaged with archaeology in the present, with research that is happening now. This display case features finds from an excavation that took place just down the road, conducted by the Cambridge Archaeological Unit on the site of the John Lewis department store. These objects are among the finds from the site, and they include even shop fittings from the antecedent shop, Robert Sale itself. We hold the largest collection of archaeological objects from this region, from East Anglia, anywhere in the world. We're a museum of Cambridge. We're a museum for Cambridge, for the communities around the university and the town. People can come here from the neighbouring villages, from the area, and identify objects that are found from their own homes, from their own areas. In this museum, we care for great historic collections, but we're concerned above all about the lives that these great treasures from the past have in the present. We're currently engaged in research on the collections made by Captain James Cook during his three voyages to the Pacific. These paddles were some of the first objects collected by any European from New Zealand. A bracelet made of pig's tusks, which was used by uh, Hawaiian dancers, was one of the earliest objects collected from Hawaii. These comb-like instruments were used in tattooing in Tahiti. Um, it was during the Cook's first voyage that European sailors were tattooed for the first time by Pacific Islanders. This is part of a story of European uh, culture as well. It was during Captain Cook's voyages that contacts were made for the first time between the peoples of this vast region of the world and Europeans. This remarkable Maori flagpole was carved in 1920 by Tene Waitari, who was perhaps the greatest Maori carver of the colonial period. It was created for a special occasion. In that year, Prince Edward, the Prince of Wales, was undertaking a tour of the Dominions and the colonies to thank them for their support during the First World War. He was presented with all sorts of gifts at a massive public ceremony in the town of Rotorua in New Zealand's North Island. The flagpole was one of the gifts it came back to England with him on a ship. Just a few years ago, we became aware that this major historic carving that features these sorts of motifs, the hallmarks of Maori art, uh, was out there in the open in fairly extreme coastal weather. We engaged in a discussion with Tene Waitari's descendants and they were unreservedly supportive of the project of bringing the flagpole to this museum. This process that brought a great historic object to an ethnographic museum with the support of the descendants, the community, is probably unprecedented. Mm -hmm.